<laughs> now, 80% of that we're talking now about the tightening of monetary policies as a result of what I just went through, as a result of the inflation that was engendered by these asinine policies. So 80% of global central banks have raised interest rates recently. The U.S. rates are now as high as they were in the global financial crisis. They, in the global financial crisis, so leading from, say, 2004 to 2006, interest rates were raised from 1% to five and a quarter. This time around, they went from zero to five and a quarter. But as I just mentioned, and we all, you don't need me to go through how much time will we have left. We have, we have some time. Yeah, left. We got as much time as you need, Michael. Go we for don't it. need, you don't need me to go through what happened in the global financial crisis and the meltdown of the banking system globally. We have the same level today, but we got there faster. We got there in one year, not two years. And the level of debt outstanding is much greater. And the, the existence of asset bubbles is much greater. And these asset bubbles need constant fuel for them to, to increase. And you take away that fuel, and that is what we have done. We are in the process of doing that, and that's when things break, like four banks going out of business. And, and I wanna I don't want to jump ahead, but I can hear people saying, Well, ah, well, what? well what's happening? How come the market's not melting down? I'm mm -hmm. gonna explain what I why I think um the economy hasn't collapsed yet. But again, I'm gonna pause for uh any questions you might have. No, I mean, look, yeah, I, I think you're feeding the, the audience exactly what it wants. Uh, Pastor Pento is preaching to the choir here. I, I don't want to be guilty of interrupting him. Um, let, let, let's actually go to that point. And if you can, um, I've been talking about this a lot of late on the channel, which is um, liquidity. Um, yep. Obviously, you know, we were shoving a ton of liquidity into the system during the pandemic. We we experienced the, the twin monetary and fiscal cliffs that you talked about where the spigots largely got turned off. Um, but, but it seems like right now there's a lot of cross currents going on. Um, first off, uh, what I've been hearing about a lot recently from people is, is um, this distortion is created by, you know, shoving a ton of liquidity into the system and that we are still experiencing the pig through the Python process where they're saying there was so much liquidity, the pig is still in the Python. Like it hasn't it hasn't fully exited yet. And, and that's supporting prices to a certain extent. Then there are, um, you know, other things that are supportive of liquidity. Um, there is the, uh, the the new term bank lending facilities that have been announced. It's, it's not QE, but but some argue that the market's treating it like it is. There are some central banks that are still easing, like Japan and China. We've had the China reopening uh, starting mm -hmm. around um, uh, October of last year or fall of last year. Um, uh, and so there's, you know, th th there are some that are saying, hey, that that's enough to actually be sort of a net liquidity positive move. And of course, there's other things going on in terms of, oh, and the TGA has been spending money by, by draining the TGA. That's That's liquidity positive. Now that may flip to negative once the debt ceiling uh, is, is is raised, and that's going to start hoovering liquidity out. But at the same time, the Treasury will be able to start raising debt again for the Inflation Reduction Act, which we're putting stimulus back into the economy. So, so it's a confusing time to be understanding: is the tide rising or not? I know as we measure it by M two, it's going down, but there are these other things going on. So in your answer, if you can touch on liquidity as best you're able to measure it right now, I think folks would love to hear that. <laughs> well, you kind of just answered the, <laughs> you kind of just did it for me, but I, I put a, I'll put a couple of data points on that if you don't mind. Not um, at all. I'll put some data points on the, on the pig and the Python. So the start of 2020, M2 money supply was $15.3 trillion. In March of 22, it shot up to $21.7 trillion. So from 15.3 to 21.7. That is a 6.4 in 6.4 trillion dollar increase in the M2 money supply. That is a 42% increase in the M2 money supply in two years. That is absolutely unprecedented. And I believe that is 
keeping a lot of liquidity and gamblers hot and heavy in the stock market. 42 percent in two years. Now the M2 money supply before the pandemic was growing at a rate of about four percent per annum. That was normal for it to increase four percent per annum. M2, not the base money supply. M2, broader a broader aggregate. Um, but now it's shrinking. It shrank by over just over four percent year over year. So I look at things from a rate of change basis. So it is true that there's a lot of money out there that has to be absorbed yet but we're on the way there and that's that's the nexus between what i just said so think about a lot of money supply rate of change falling so we're going from rapid inflation to disinflation which is what i said would happen it's happening it's taking a long time to occur but the model that i created and i'm going to hopefully dive into that i'm going to make sure we have a lot of time to dive into the model um tells me that we're headed for a recession still heading that way that there but it's just taking a lot of time to get there even more time than i honestly thought that it would take but you look when you look at the data and the numbers behind the money supply growth it's it's very clear why why it's happening now in in march it, it, let me touch on some other things you mentioned in march of 23 march of this year the banking system started to to falter correct we had four banks now Four banks fail in total. Yeah, the, the, the three of the four largest bank failures in U.S. history have happened in the past two months. Correct. Two, three, and four. Correct. So um, that caused the Fed to launch something called the Bank Term Funding Program. It, I call it QE Light. Danielle DiMartino Booth, who I respect greatly, I don't think she likes to call it Q, QE at all. Um, there are people who think it's just flat out QE. This is how I look at it. Look, look for it for going to that. Let me just say it was four hundred billion dollars increase in the base money supply in two weeks, Adam. Mm -hmm. Two weeks. So for those who think that the Fed is like you know uh, Powell is the reincarnation reincarnation of Paul Volcker, maybe they ought to think again. I mean, he printed. Think about printing four hundred billion dollars in base money supply in two weeks. Now, it's not really. Q I call it QE light because it's it's not QE because so in QE is when you when the fed prints money they they put print credit actually reserves they give it to primary dealers primary dealers surrender their assets mortgage backed securities and treasuries and the fed says take my reserves and go out and make loans and buy more debt buy more bonds because you know what you can do that and front run me because i'm going to come behind you and do the same darn thing again next month you know, eighty-five billion a month is what we were doing, right? In, in the in the in the the shank of the QE, right? 